It's going to be very difficult for Sean McAuliffe to be able to send this up. Thank you. Well, well, well. Well, it was uh, International Women's Day yesterday, and what better way to celebrate it than by releasing the Tom Report exonerating Alan Tudge from any wrongdoing <laughs> the previous Friday. Showing sensitivity, the government released it at 4.45pm to avoid it being on the evening's news, which was uh, <laughs> very nice of them, and I think, I think they should be applauded. <laughs> now, um... Now, I've read the report and I've got to tell you, it is disgusting. I mean, I mean, look at it, all the good bits have been redacted. <laughs> it's a story as old as politics itself. An education minister has four occasions of intimacy with a staffer not involving sexual intercourse. The staffer gets promoted with his approval after the first occasion of intimacy not involving sexual intercourse and an inquiry finds that there has been no breach of ministerial standards. <laughs> and, uh, and I would also, I would like to congratulate the media for their restraint in reporting on the matter. It was uh, almost a full hour before the Sydney Morning Herald published the minister's text to his staffer <laughs> and, uh, and the Australian published the uh, staffer's text to the minister. So uh, some desultory applause for the media too, I think. <laughs> no, not too much, not too much, not too much. Now, despite apparently not doing anything wrong, Alan has decided not to return to the front bench, preferring instead to remain under the bus where the PM threw him <laughs> and, and devote his time and energy to a doomed re-election campaign. The good news, though, is that his portfolio will be looked after by this man, Stuart Robert. Oh. <laughs> no, Stuart is a safe pair of hands and he knows all about the importance of ministerial standards, having breached them when he was Human Services <laughs> Minister and Assistant Minister for Defence, and he went to Beijing to attend a ceremony to sign a deal with a mining company in which he had a financial interest. And uh, to be fair to Stuart, he's, uh, he's been a good acting education minister so far. Uh, within only a week of being appointed, he rejected six approved research programs because they did not represent value for taxpayer money. And Stuart also knows the value of taxpayer money, having once had to pay back $38,000 of it <laughs> in excessive home internet charges. Yes, certainly. Let's applaud Stuart. Now, Stuart is already the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills and Small and Family Business, as well as Acting Education Minister. Not bad for a man who can barely find his own ass when it was sitting on the back bench. <laughs> but, the, uh, but the Prime Minister... ..had bigger thorns in his paw this week than an Education Minister who didn't do anything wrong and the fact that his Acting Education Minister is Stuart Robodet. <laughs> He's, uh, he's got an election to win. And the good news is that the Liberal Party's chances of doing that have certainly been enhanced now that they have some candidates for it in New South Wales. As you know, the party's federal executive and the state branch have been squabbling like seagulls over who should run for the nine federal New South Wales seats. The glacial speed with which the party has dealt with this made the progress of a National Integrity Commission look like it's in a large hadron collider. <laughs> The New South Wales State Branch blamed uh, Immigration Minister Alex Hawke for failing to make himself available to review candidates, ultimately engineering a crisis which required federal intervention. He even failed to show up to a Supreme Court hearing to resolve the matter. Anyway, it's all resolved now and the PM will, will get what he wanted all along, a bunch of candidates who will do his bidding. <laughs> Incidentally, we are, we are worried about Alex, if anybody has any information as to his whereabouts. <laughs> Please send your entry to our Where's Hawkey competition and, <laughs> and you could win a pair of Richard Glover Lover glove covers. <laughs> Fondle ABC Radio's favourite drive presenter with these hand-stitched, washable, poly-cotton hand and finger protectors guaranteed to fit your gloves like a glove. Mm, that's completely unnecessary on a number of levels. I'm sorry, Richard. <laughs> Of course, it's not all been good news. The PM has been in quarantine, stuck in this hellhole for the last week <laughs> with COVID-19. And I was pleased to see that uh, when the news broke of the PM's illness, uh, Albo, his sworn enemy, was uh, quick to pass on his hopes that the PM overcame not only COVID-19, but two other afflictions as well, tweeting that he wished him a speedy recovery from not only COVID, but from myself. <laughs> 
and all the Australian Labor team. But uh, certainly. Very nice, isn't it? But of course, it should be remembered, it's the long-term effects of Labor that can be really debilitating. <laughs> The PM's work experience and excursion coordinator is Donald McEngadine. <laughs> Donald, uh, it must have been difficult for the PM not to be able to get out and about this last week. Well, of course it is. It's been very difficult for ScoMo and everyone trapped in that house with him. Uh, <laughs> in any given week, we would normally be out and about in the community, being photographed, rubbing elbows with the quiet Australians, pointing at maps, mishandling their tools, fumbling his words, <laughs> rivaling Florence Foster Jenkins for tone deafness. Yes, when previously in self-isolation, though, he was still able to perform his duties as PM, wasn't he? No, of course he was. Yeah. Just because you don't see him being PM doesn't mean he stops being PM. As they say, if a tree falls in a forest, <laughs> chances are there's a koala in it and it's part of a dodgy land clearing deal. Right, so, uh, so it's business as usual? Of course. Last time I was able to get off some great shots of the scomster uh, <laughs> exercising... <laughs> there he is. Exercising while listening to Tina Arena's greatest hits. Right. So just a short workout then? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but look how blurry I made his legs look. Oh, yeah. Like he was going so fast, the camera couldn't even register the speed, like he's a, like he's a character in a Warner Brothers cartoon. Yeah, it's, it's a very powerful image. Mm. And I also got this candid moment of him on his mobile, scrolling through the comments about the previous picture after we posted it on Instagram. Yeah, what it makes up for in raw emotion, it lacks in trousers. Mm. <laughs> It's an homage to this portrait of John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Back in the 60s, of course, it wasn't considered appropriate for a world leader to show a man's bare legs. No, well, different times. Well, of course they are. Yeah. Regrettably, this time around, I couldn't get into Kira Billy to shoot the big fella, and he had to do selfies. Mm -hmm. Look at that. <laughs> Shit house. Mm. <laughs> No composition of shot, framing's uninspired. I, I told him to use landscape mode, but he, he reckons his arms are too short to hold the phone that far away. Yeah, he's got no idea. He's no fucking Richard Avedon, that's for sure. <laughs> Can I ask some uh, non-cult of personality questions, if I may? Firstly, about the war in Ukraine. Oh, of course. All right. Now, one of the practical ways Australia is helping Ukraine, aside from calling Russia bullies, whether they like it or not, <laughs> is uh, to support those fleeing the country. The visa applications uh, of all Ukrainian citizens have been put on the top of the pile. Yes, and I hope you notice the helpful visual demonstration by ScoMo there of putting something on top of a pile of other things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a bit more of that, we wouldn't have to bother listening to him. I'm talking to Donald McKenzie. <laughs> When he says the uh, visa applications of all Ukrainian citizens, have all 44 million Ukrainian citizens applied for Australian visas? I wouldn't think so, Sean, unless it's some Labor branch stacking exercise. <laughs> he has been criticised, though, for this, hasn't he? Oh, I'm sure the usual suspects have had a crack, Sean. Which myopic left-wing loonies are at it this time? Well, the Australian Christian lobby. <laughs> His spokesman said, by go to the top of the pile, what does this say in regards to those fleeing the horrors of the Taliban in Afghanistan? Well, well, I take that point, but when you have a pile, someone has to be on top of the pile. And someone on the bottom, don't they? Well, assuming there needs to be a pile at all, does there have to be a pile? Well, if there wasn't a pile, all the visa applicants would just pile in. How do you think we managed to get unemployment so low? A pile of visa applications is far more preferable to the electorate than a pile of unemployed. Well, speaking of unemployed, uh, what will Scott Morrison do if he loses the election? He'll go straight to the top of that pile. <laughs> I'm still talking to Donald McKenzie. <laughs> Donald, the uh, PM's gone hard on China for not speaking out against Russia. And he doesn't apologise for that. Yeah. Or, indeed, anything. Yeah. Australia is a country... And when we see something go through to the keeper after coming off the edge of the bat, we'll call it out. It is inexcusable for a country with such a close and long-standing relationship to remain silent on such an issue. And I guess the PM will similarly uh, be pushing India to speak out against uh, the Russian invasion. Well, we're not in the business of telling other leaders how they should run their own sovereign nation, Sean. That's a matter for them. Well, thank you very much, Donald McCangity, then, for coming in tonight. Please accept uh, this uh, Scoma Mix blender. <laughs> Ideal for uh, incompleting sentences and half-assing analogies to make the PM signature word smoothies. <laughs> That's nice. Daughter was written by my poem. <laughs> How good. <laughs> Not particularly. <laughs>
Well, again, another good political interview from me, I think. And uh, we cross now <laughs> live to Laura Tingle for her reaction. <laughs> yes, very much as I thought. Thank you very much, Laura. Um, now, while we've paused, a bit of housekeeping, if I may, and uh, you'll notice that in honour of International Women's Day, I am doing it. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, some congratulations. Home Affairs Minister Karen Andrews has announced the finalists in the banned terrorist organisation list for 2022, and they include Hayat Tahir al-Sham, Haraz al-Din and the National Socialist Order, the Abu Sayyaf Group, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in the lands of Islamic Maghreb, and Jamaa Islamia. So, uh, well done there, I think. Uh, not too much. But... And uh, given the criteria for being a banned terrorist organisation includes uh, being, in the government's view, uh, extremist groups with hateful ideologies, commiserations to Get Up and Climate 200, who <laughs> must have only just missed out. Still, there's always next year. Uh, also, uh, there, uh, an apology. Last week, I referred to the Quad Alliance as being comprised of Australia, India, the US and the UK, whereas it is Australia, India, the US and Japan. And I also suggested that PM hosted those talks, whereas, in fact, they are hosted by uh, our Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne. And I think we have footage of Maurice Payne hosting uh, the Quad Talks. Um, there they are. <laughs> That's her there. Um, we, uh, we pride ourselves on accuracy in this show. Uh, right now, though, uh, with the federal debt having grown by 221% in the last 20 years, equating to 10% a year and currently at 44.1% of GDP, it's, uh, it's higher since Menzies was PM in 1964. Here's Tosh Greenslade with a wig and glasses and a cumbersome analogy. <laughs> That's exactly right, Sean. Net interest alone on our debt for the coming financial year is expected to be $14.8 billion, which, to give you some idea of how much that is, it's about 93% of what we all paid for last year in undeserved JobKeeper. So what can be done to avoid the inevitable slashing of government spending on things that can't be stuffed into pork barrels, like unemployment benefits and the NDIS? Well, the solution is simple when you realise that money can be made out of nothing by borrowing even more of it from our global investors, reinvesting it in our sovereign wealth fund, and then distributing the dividends through a trust to fund our welfare system. At real negative interest rates, the cost of servicing the loan is less than GDP growth, meaning our entire welfare system would cost us nothing. Enough return and we could fund the age pension the same way, free preschool for all and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Or even more important things like the ABC and my wage. Sean? <laughs> Tossed green salad there in a wig and glasses being satirical about modern monetary theory. Not that uh, things don't seem to be going OK without it, like many of us forced to stay at home for months on end <laughs> with nothing to do but eat and drink. The Australian economy is now 3.4% bigger than it was before the pandemic. Earlier today, I spoke to Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. Well, the December quarter, as you say, saw 3.4% growth, which was the equal strongest growth that we've seen in a quarter for 46 years. So that is a real achievement for the Australian economy. So take a bow, Australian economy, but stand up straight again quickly before Labor boots you up the arse. <laughs> Still, what a magnificent economy it is, though. In fact, I'd like to take the opportunity tonight to nominate it for Australian of the Year. Uh, it's been so resilient in the face of natural disasters, hammered by the global pandemic, decimated by JobKeeper, uh, lurching from one lockdown to the next, and uh, after it all having delivered an annual growth rate of 4.2% on the eve of an election. It's, uh, it, certainly, it certainly smiled on Scott Morrison, uh, unlike previous Australians of the Year. <laughs> A round of applause for the economy. Now, the, uh, the trouble with being in the middle of an unofficial election campaign, though, is that you can't use official campaign money to pay for stuff and have to run off your posters and other material on the work photocopier at taxpayers' expense when no one's looking. <laughs> the Treasurer's Office, though, has found a neat solution to this problem by accidentally sending its stuff to an ALP photocopier <laughs> for printing. Walden Heck, do you look after IT in Parliament House? <laughs> no, I do, Sean. I keep everything up to date, ship shape and Bristol fashion. <laughs> Mimeograph machines, pneumatic tubes, Bakelite telephones, potato stencils, baskets on pulleys, phone message spikes, street urchins for some of the more long distance communications. You name it, I'm all over it when it comes to state of the art intra office communications. How did posters of Josh Frydenberg and private correspondence from the Australian Electoral Commission saying the posters might breach the Australian Electoral Act end up coming out of the photocopy?
copier of a Labor office instead of Josh Friedman. That's the first I've heard it. That's outrageous. Yeah. I've got a good mind to type a strong letter to the Treasurer. <laughs> Note to self, order some more carbon paper. There's, uh, there's obviously been some mix-up with uh, nominating the default printer. You might need more toner. I assume, uh, I assume each office has its own dedicated security code to tie to avoid this type of thing happening? Oh, yes. It is essential that each office has its unique passwords and numerical combination and that access to same be restricted to only those with sufficient clearance. Mm -hmm. I've got them all written down in my little black book here. <laughs> Uh, Josh Frydenberg, 9265643, password Frido71. Mm -hmm. Bit easy to crack that one, he should change it. Scott Morrison's got the right idea. 1234, password Godboy666. <laughs> but usually, usually. Yeah. He just gets Phil Gatians to burn everything. Oh, which reminds me, I was supposed to delete this Tourism Australia report on him, but I keep getting a 401 unauthorised error warning. <laughs> See? Was <laughs> well, there anything else? Uh, yes, well, we have been having trouble with our air conditioning. Oh, yes. Well, that'd be your flanges. Well, while you're here... <laughs> Thank you, Warman. Tricky uh, things, flanges. Yes. This Sunday on Grantchester, an unpopular local dead shit has been murdered. Colin Grimm says you bought a jar of pickled onions from his shop just before closing time, about half past five. He wouldn't know his arse from his elbow. He's a confused old fool. That'd put a 90-minute hole in your alibi, though, wouldn't it? What's he doing here? Why am I being interrogated by a bleeding vicar? Shut up and answer the question. <laughs> well, I can't do both. <laughs> What is it with you, look? Father Dowling, Father Brown, all acting like you're from bleeding Scotland Yard. Who's saying mass down the church, then? Mr. Plod? So what time did you get home on Friday night, then? I told you, seven o'clock. You're lying! You went to that shop to buy pickled onions! Admit it! And after the suspect demands to see D.I. Keating's oh, superior God. officers... This is Chief Inspector <laughs> Reverend Tom Valvoline and Superintendent Bishop Harvey Norman. Reverend Davenport becomes the subject of a formal complaint. Could this be the end of Reverend Will's sleuthing days? Looks unlikely, doesn't it? Grantchester, Sunday, on ABC and iView. And the old better ones are on Nine now, I think. Well, a monkey paw, whale ear bones, grey wolf skin, elephant feet and an orangutan skull. If this sounds like someone you'd like to meet, call Unique Escort Services today. <laughs> Another good way of saving taxpayers' money is to rely on charity, and the Defence Minister, Peter Dutton, has popped some flack lately after he started a GoFundMe page for those impacted by the floods. The PM has defended the move with his signature disingenuous obtuseness. I commend Peter for what he's doing. I mean, it might... I mean, I don't understand the criticism of it, frankly. I, I really don't. Mm. <laughs> Brian Pegmatite, gatekeeper to the Defence Minister's... Hellmouth. Doesn't uh, Peter understand the same money ministers use for rorting can also be used to fund disaster relief? Sure, the money used for rorts is already spoken for. And while it's true that the Auditor-General has found Peter is more likely to fund community grants in coalition seats, it's hard to tell which seats are coalition ones when they're underwater. <laughs> So the GoFundMe page would be fairer because it would avoid government and ministerial discretion entirely. Well, the PM has decided to abandon $100 million worth of previous car park rorts promised last year, which the PM said would mean... What Australians are getting are more car parks. Australians are the winners. Thanks very much. <laughs> Why not just use that money to help the flood victims? Sure, GoFundMe donations will get to people a lot faster than emergency relief funding, as the $5 billion in unspent natural disaster money attests. Sure, but money from charities often ends up in courts for a long time and not necessarily going to the people who need it most and when they need it most. Sean, it's election time. Rest <laughs> assured that the people who need to get any money will be photographed receiving it in the form of large novelty checks delivered by their local members. If it comes from government and is going to a safe or market, marginal seat, Peter will be there handing it over. <laughs> if it's from the GoFundMe page, then Peter will be there taking credit for that as well. It's win-win. I'm talking to Brian Pegmatite. What? Still to come. <laughs> why? And 
for fuck's sake. That's coming up later in No Judgment. <laughs> Brian, can I ask you about Peter's portfolio? And I'm not talking about this study of him <laughs> as Audrey Hepburn from Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> what a hunk. The, uh, <laughs> The Defence Department has rejected vehicles you're having built at a cost of $1.3 billion because of concerns about their brakes. So that, that seems like a waste of money, money that could be sitting unused in a disaster relief fund earning interest. Sean, we in the Ministry of Defence would like to think that in our own way, how we use public monies paying for things like $45 billion frigates that are slow and unsafe, $16 billion joint strike fighters which can barely fly, and $171 billion nuclear submarines on top of the $2.4 billion we've already paid for the cancelled French ones. <laughs> We're a bit of a disaster ourselves. <laughs> These $1.3 billion faulty brakes on some land-based vehicle are a drop in the ocean. Yes, but, but given you've identified the problem with the brakes, why has the contractor continued to produce them? And the problem with making faulty brakes is that once you get going, production is almost <laughs> impossible to stop. Well, thanks, Brian. Thank you very much. And uh, for coming in tonight, please accept this tub of climate change denial apolitan ice cream. Ah! Uh, the great unrelenting summer treat. Oh. It's all melted. Yes. Well, don't worry, somebody else will clean that up. <laughs> the inability of the government to even deliver a rort to itself is a free pass for this man, who could soon be <laughs> our Prime Minister if he doesn't say anything stupid. Treating taxpayers' funds as if it was Liberal Party funds. Except that the government actually spends Liberal Party funds, so there goes his shot at the top job. <laughs> Treasurer Josh Frydenberg, though, was keen to assure us that the Urban Congestion Fund... ..remains an important part of the government's plans to get more cars off the roads and to make public transport more accessible. And I'm glad to hear that, because I think people are too quick to jump to the conclusion that just because the government isn't doing anything about something, that means it's not important to them. I mean, <laughs> I mean on that logic, a federal anti-corruption commission isn't important to them. <laughs> hey, who'd like to hear a cute animal story? Yeah! Okay, cue animation and musical sting. Science! Okay, now. <laughs> good news for those who enjoy the horrific consequences of crimes against nature. When man plays God, it usually doesn't turn out well for either the mad scientist or the creation that murders him. But the University of Melbourne are hoping to develop technologies to de extinct the Tasmanian tiger. Lindy B. Ankle, this is very exciting news for Australians everywhere. <laughs> Right here in Australia. I'll say, Sean, mm -hmm. and it's great news for the koala and the platypus and all sorts of native critters and plants that look like dying out real soon because we haven't done anything about climate change and don't look like attending to it anytime soon. Mm. <laughs> so, it's, uh, so it's never too late. 2025, 2050, 2070, whenever. It's never too late for any species now that we can bring them back from extinction. Mm, of course, uh, we have to still be alive. Oh, some DNA, a petri dish, an ear on the back of a mouse and some sort of giant robot computer and even the human race can be saved, Sean. <laughs> we never have to worry about looking after the environment again. Do you darn this right, you celestial ball of burning <laughs> gas? We will outlive you and rule the universe for eternity! Will the, um... Will the, um... Will the Tasmanian tiger enjoy being brought back from the dead, though? I mean, he died out in 1936, so what, what will he make of the modern world? When he roamed the earth, King George VI was still king and married at first sight had mercifully not even been thought possible. Sean, we're not bringing these things back to life and then just letting them escape out the lab through the cat flap like they would in China. Mm -hmm. We'll school them in the ways of 2022 and release them back into the wild slowly in case they go feral and upset whatever's left of the ecosystem. Mm. And, and if there are problems? We'll just kill them again. <laughs> They're really easy to wipe out, as history proves. Right. Can the same approach be taken with the Great Barrier Reef? Sadly, the thylacine can't breathe underwater, Sean. We've tried it thousands of times with native cats and every time they drown. <laughs> no fear. We are in the process of future-proofing the Great Barrier Reef, creating a more resilient coral by accelerating the naturally occurring evolutionary processes. Right. Hot housing, natural selection. Conditions and temperatures in our oceans are perfect for exactly that, Sean. And when they reach boiling point, kabloom! A super monster coral will rise out of the sea like Godzilla, but more beautiful and worth forking out tourist dollars to have a deco 
that. All right. Well, thank you very much to Lindy B. Enkel for coming along tonight. Uh, would you please accept, on behalf of the show, this Scott Morrison arc welding of autocracy mask? That's for your support. Absolutely. Next, Peter Jackson's 312 hour documentary on the last National Party Room meeting under Michael McCormick continues. Then later, catch all the action with the super yachts seized by the West in The Russian Oligarchs, Sydney to Hobart. Welcome back. Well, despite the coming budget being likely to roll out more pork barrels for self-funded retirees and the hope they'll vote the Morrison government back in out of self-interest, what about those in their autumn years who can't afford to be self-funded or retired? Bo Weevil megafauna. <laughs> Like most Australians, Blinkier Mushroom is a 105-year-old retiree who, because of insufficient superannuation, must move out of the modest rental property negatively geared by her owner's son and move into an Almohadian nursing home, providing she converts and reverse mortgages her funeral plot to pay for extras like food and running water. Oh, that's nice. As her room is only partially subsidised by the federal government and her pension, paid directly to her care provider's offshore account is not enough to cover costs. Blinkia works part-time as a rodeo clown, entertaining people lining up for COVID vaccinations in her local Bunnings car park. Could you give me a hand, love? She also contributes to the gig economy with the occasional 14-hour shift at a fulfilment and delivery centre when her sister can't do it because of exhaustion, clinical depression or vitamin D deficiency brought on by lack of sunlight. Today, Blinkia is in luck. Her sister has rickets and she must get down to the fulfilment centre by 6am to replace her or else. Like most Australians, Blinkia travels to work on an old ride-on lawn mower, bearing a flag with a picture of a vampire on it that she bought at a garage sale run by Matt Canavan. Blinkia picks up a few extra much-needed dollars grabbing products and putting them in a tub before a bell rings. An electronic glove tells a computer how many items she's touched every 30 seconds. If she doesn't achieve her target, she's electrocuted. If she does achieve her target, she's not electrocuted as much. And accrues points that go towards a toilet break of uncertain duration, not including walking time. Oh, I'm not complaining. It's gratifying to know that I'm still a valued member of our society. Get back to work, you old crone. <laughs> More importantly, though, it gives me something that I think we all need and that many of us forget in this business of life. Human dignity. Lights off after 7 p.m. Good night. Sweet dreams. And not talking. <laughs> yes. Mm. A bit sad, that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, not coming up because Star Strike's on in a minute. Italy's Mount Etna elects new Pope. And retired ADF personnel already in aged care facilities called up and mobilised to go back in and look after themselves. And finally, we mentioned the Vivian Tom report into Alan Tudge earlier in the show, and uh, a lot of people have been wondering why it took so long for it to be made public, given it was delivered to the government back in December of last year. Next week, a special program that looks at what's been happening to that report during those intervening months. Here's a sneak peek. <laughs> This is the Touch Report. <laughs> Don't miss it. Giant baby.